Welcome to the fourth topic panel discussion of the day here at the Schools and Nursery Show in Dubai. My name is Fiona Cottam and I'm the principal at Heartland International School and I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by uh, Sarah Hollis who is the principal at American School of Creative Science, BEAM, uh, and also Emma Navin who is the head of junior school at uh, my sister's school, NLCS, just across the road. Um, the topic that we've been asked to discuss today is one that I'm sure is you know, it's, it plays at the forefront of parents' minds and has done throughout the last 14 months of the pandemic. And it is anxiety in children, spotting the signs, supporting and managing. And I think, ladies, you know, it's fair to say that children have always suffered from levels of anxiety. Perhaps the pandemic has enabled us to have more open discussions and dialogues about it. Um, and the last conversation that we've just had with the group was about mental health issues in children. So it, it sort of, it is inextricably linked in together, but spotting those signs of anxiety, um, particularly in young children. If I start um, with you, you know, head of junior school. Um, so it's really for making sure that teachers notice where there's something different than, than maybe, um, you know, the normal behavior for that child. Uh, a child who's complaining of tummy ache, for example, would be an indicator that maybe they're worried about something. Maybe they started a, a, a pattern of behavior that wasn't in place before. It could be nail biting. It could be numerous trips to the bathroom. Um, it could be school refusal. Um, you know, there are many, many indicators that, that teachers would be able to observe that are coming up. It could be that they're actually openly, maybe their behavior, like I said, in the class has, has changed the way that they, they maybe become more anxious, crying, not wanting to separate from their parent or not wanting to go home, mm. uh, either or. Um, you know, so there are, there are triggers that are definitely able to be, be picked up. But what the most important thing is to, is to make that connection with that trigger and ask the question, is there something going on here? What do I need to do to, mm. to follow that up a little bit more? And sometimes we're worried to ask the question, aren't we? Because mm. we're, we're terrified of the discussion that might follow through. Yeah. And both, yeah. you know, culturally sometimes mm -hmm. um, for parents, it's a difficult topic to address, yeah. isn't it? But yeah. as you say, it's important that they lean into the school and mm -hmm. look for, for support. Yeah. Sarah, your, your thoughts on that? I agree. It's the changes in behavior, uh, sleep, mood, and I think that's why more than ever before that homeschool connection is just so vital because we need to have those dialogues, even though they might be uncomfortable, to talk about whether we're seeing the same change in behavior at home. Also difficulties in concentrating in school when they're consumed with worries, they're not able to focus on their schoolwork. Um, but what I've noticed also is that sometimes that tendency to mislabel sometimes, and we've done a lot of work to overcome that in the sense that a child might look disruptive. Uh, maybe some symptoms you think are related to ADHD. And it's very tempted to label that as a behavior problem, but actually it's uh, anxiety manifesting in a different way and presenting as a behavior problem, even though it's anxiety. It's interesting. I mean, certainly, um, it's very personal view, and I have no academic or scientific research to support it. But sometimes I think the anxieties of us as adults, they manifest themselves on children, don't they? What can we do or what advice can we give to parents? I'm sure it's difficult for parents. We've got family issues. We've got job loss. We've got families separated by miles. We've got illness. We've got bereavement. We, we've struggled with so many things that have been so different for us in the last 14 months. Any advice that we can maybe give to parents in terms of how we can help them and how, as schools, we can support them? Yeah, Emma? I think I think to me the the key um, there is communication. I mean, clearly there are family circumstances that maybe parents don't want to talk about. We're aware of that, but as you said, when they when they are anxious, the children pick that up, and so maybe that separation at the door in the morning is is going to be more apparent. And the parent may not necessarily have made the connection mm -hmm. that it's to do with their the mm -hmm. way that they're reacting to a situation that's happened at home. So that dialogue with the teacher or whoever it may be, um, you know, in the school is, is really critical, but, you know, ultimately being incredibly sensitive, um, mm. but just saying, well, you know, something changed or something happened and, and being mindful that parents may not always want to reveal what's going on in their, yeah. in their home life or may not, like sort of made the connection that, oh, that's because that happened. Mm. Now I see why they're behaving like that. And, and also anything that we can do before that, in terms of um, parent workshops and you know, even all the school counsellor, and it's you know, they, they being sort of reactive, but also being proactive in yeah. terms of the bigger picture of what we do as a school. But I think to me, the most important aspect is is trying to build that relationship with with any family in the school to approach a difficult 
um, mm. subject yeah. very, very sensitively and mm. working as closely with the family to address that. So, honey, I think being very key, are they mirroring my, just simply what's my anxiety as a parent, is that being picked up? But also I think now, especially this day and age with what's on the news and also COVID and, you know, international news in general, I think being very aware of how much they're listening to our conversations about what's going on and then trying to make sure that some of our conversations shift to the positives in the news mm -hmm. and the positives that are going around, even related to the difficult situations. But it really, it, I think we have to be conscious of what we're saying in front of them. And also role modeling, how we manage our own anxiety. That really makes it seem more normal to the kids as well. And also they're able then to develop some strategies because they see it's something that we deal with successfully and we're able to self-regulate. And we're talking about it in an open way of how we can manage that anxiety. I think you picked up on a really interesting point there because our children um, have far more access, for example, to news and social media than I'm sure I ever did as a child in terms of even the news on the TV. Yeah. You know, it, it, now yeah. it's 24-7, yeah. isn't it? And, and it's constant, those mm -hmm. updates the whole time. And, and you're absolutely right. There are, there are things that as children perhaps we never knew about before mm -hmm. and our children now know about all the time, which does give them grave cause for concern. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and of course, we ask them to wear masks so, mm -hmm. so they know there's something different in the world, don't they? something real to be afraid of yeah. and so that fear that we're feeling becomes more real it's more tangible than ever before because general anxiety could manifest of concerns of illness but now there is an actual concern that's everywhere we see it on the sign posting it's in the news we see the numbers daily um, and we they see the parents reaction to those numbers so it's being mindful of, I think, talking about what they're hearing and what they're seeing. Those frequent updates are very stressing. Exactly. We, we've talked about, you know, the, the key to this balance and the key to us working together is absolutely strong communication. I mean, mm -hmm. Emma, you picked up on that. It's that relationship piece with home and school. Are there ways, do you think, that as we move forward, those schools will need to adapt their curriculums or, or adapt their delivery methodologies or content to try and address some of these anxiety issues. And, and I'm just wondering if at mm. NLCS, for example, you've, you're looking at modification of curriculum or support measures in place. Yeah, I think a really key part of it is, is actually your whole sort of PSE program, if you like, you know, really addressing social and emotional needs with the students. But, you know, key to all that is to help the students understand that it's okay to feel worried, it's okay to feel upset, it's okay to feel happy, mm -hmm. sad, whatever emotion it is, but it's having the skills to know what to do when you feel like that. So I think, you know, more and particularly this year as well, when I think, you know, wearing of a mask and sometimes they're not being able to get a true sense of how the child is actually feeling, um, doesn't necessarily come across in the same way that it would do, if you, you know, uh, before is to really make sure that you're providing within the curriculum those opportunities for, um, you know, various themes to be discussed, mm -hmm. to be addressed. And, and we, we have a particular program that we've been looking at this year to really uh, help the students understand about self-regulation and to, um, you know, what strategies can we use and really applying, you know, teaching them some, you know, specific skills that they could use when they feel like that. It's okay, but what could you do? Maybe you just need to sit quietly, take a few deep breaths. I mean, there's a bigger picture, of mm -hmm. course, when, mm -hmm. as, you know, it's related to anxiety, but just some strategies to help them uh, through that. It's and I suppose you, you weave it into an IB curriculum, yes. don't yeah. you? You know, it, it, yeah. it, it falls in place through mm -hmm. different strands of the curriculum yeah. that we can address those. I think yeah. coupled with, you know, the strong moral education program mm -hmm. that the government has put in place, it yeah. does help us address some of those with social studies. Um, Zara, you're at an American curriculum school. Yes. Again, yeah. how are you addressing those types of issues or making we're, modifications? Yeah, we're trying to, well, what we've done is we've actually dedicated, you know, half an hour every day to you know personal social emotional health but we've really made uh, mental health a stronger priority focus this year because talking about mental health really does help take the stigma out of it yeah. it's okay not to be okay mm -hmm. and as for all ages it's really important even the kg to understand what are emotions how do they change um, how do we as you said self-regulate really practicing some of those mindful techniques within the school day as well has really helped integrating that into PE. Also more education has helped to talk about mental health in some of their units as well, but really making it a priority focus, talking about that mental health. And then 
for kids to understand when this emotion is a bit more intense than usual and how to then ask for help. Our priority focus has been knowing who to go to mm -hmm. when I'm not okay. And it's really important to us that 100% can say, I know who to go to if I'm not okay. And having those self-referral QR codes around the school, you know, indiscreetly just, you know, saying, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. I need someone to come see me. Yeah. So that's really been a priority focus uh, this academic year, mm -hmm. more so than ever before, yeah. because I think the social situation has just highlighted that. Mm. Um, and imagine being a kid with anxiety in the school, with social distancing. You want that to feel that connection and sometimes need that because you're feeling so overwhelmed. Really finding how to then give them alternative coping skills and strategies to manage that anxiety when they're just feeling like, I need a hug, but I can't have a hug right now. Yeah. Do you know, isn't it quite incredible though that we're actually having this conversation mm -hmm. and how powerful it is that we're sitting here today having discussions about children's mental health about their anxiety and about their needs because you're absolutely right Sarah for, for too or for too long these mm -hmm. types of things have been very much mm -hmm. taboo subjects let's just get on with it and everybody mm -hmm. will be okay and there's a difference between not being okay and mm -hmm. resilience mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to you know inculcate that that those skills of resilience yeah. and coping strategies, but that doesn't mean you're still not going to have bad days, does it? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've got yes. some questions coming in, actually, yeah. just from parents. And there's a, an interesting question here, and I wonder if either of you are, are happy to ask. It's, um, my teenager seems to be becoming more and more withdrawn. We're actually, actually in Abu Dhabi, but he's been on distance learning there for nearly all of the year. So, of course, we know that's been very difficult. He spends so much time on his computer and then only wants to speak to friends while playing video games. Should I be worried that he doesn't want to interact in person with others or will this pass? Now, I know it's a bit of crystal ball casing, mm. but Sarah, if I start with you, because I can um, see you maybe yeah. have an answer on the tip of yeah. your tongue there. I've, I've, I've seen several parents go through this, um, through acquaintances um, and the need for human connection. We're human beings, we need that human connection. And having that virtual connection is just not real. Um, it can help and we can find ways to meet up online and form communities, but they still need moments for that face-to-face -face interaction. So I would say, you know, maybe making a plan of how to do that with your friends, reaching out and saying, I need to have some moments where my son can maybe get together or approach the school and say, who within the parent group is willing to facilitate maybe those interactions and have those moments that we can have social interaction. I mean, you don't want to force it, but at the same time, you need to coax it and gradually, you know, build it in that they have those opportunities to socialize off the computer. Um, because again, also the danger with the computer that we have sometimes is that we just don't know what the conversations are that they're True. having as well in the chats. True. Um, but the need for human connection mm -hmm. is very important to us as social human beings. We yeah. really do need that. It's yeah. important just to say, just on that topic, to make sure, you know, two parents that you do have those safety systems in place mm -hmm. in terms of safer internet use, etc. And if you have any concerns mm -hmm. about that, please make sure you speak to your school and they will give you the best advice and guidance about how to lock down areas of the computer and the network so that you can stop those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the question though, sorry, Emma, I, I interjected I, that. I just fully support what um, mm -hmm. Sarah's saying. It's really about those tiny steps back to, um, you know, what is the plan, like coping step plan to, to that human interaction and, and having those opportunities put in place for, um, for the child because the longer, um, you know, um, the student is not mixing with others, yeah. that the harder it will become. So it's taking those tiny steps to success to try and to achieve that um, you know, human connection. But it's also the will of the child to want to do it at the same time, which is maybe wrapped up into this as well, and how and how the parent, I suppose, whether the school mm. are also involved in, mm. in um, you know, sort of breaking that pattern now to a reverse pattern of, of building up that human connection. When we talk about human connection and we talk about anxiety, um, there are groups of children who are perhaps more vulnerable than others, mm. you know, and I think of students of determination, some of them, yeah. um, who have faced probably different types of challenges in learning from home, mm -hmm. or perhaps the, the claustrophobia of the mask, yeah. even if they have exemptions, just the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. Are there any advice to parents who, who maybe have seen changes and shifts in their, their child, particularly those who are more vulnerable, who need additional types of support? 
and anything perhaps that your school has either done or ideas that you have about how they might help? A bit of an open question, really. Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that we make sure that we do with all our students who are distance learning is to give them time um, with adults in the school, um, whether it be their teacher, um, teaching assistant, but other students as well. So it's almost like a virtual play for, for our younger students, virtual break time to have that social interaction as well. So they begin to sense that this is this is okay, this is the way forward. And then, you know, the children who are in school may be saying, but it's okay to wear a mask, we're wearing a mask, and, and openly having those discussions as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've done that with some of our students who we know are are going to come back to school but have been distance learning for a considerable amount of time and, and that level of worry that's there so we've sort of facilitated additional sessions to support them with that so that they're prepared for, for a return. Okay and especially with some of our you know, students that struggle with social communication uh, really having those social play groups and uh, you know with peers you know understanding the condition the child might have and you know being able to role model social play with the child in a safe setting, of course, with social distancing. And I think really looking sometimes to our older students to take on that leadership role and coaching them to be peer mediators and also to recognize when a child looks like they're sitting off by themselves and how to broach those uh, students mm -hmm. and approach them and engage them in play, in social distance play, taking, involving the student leaders in that as well. Has really helped. Your comments are very closely linked actually to another question that we have from a parent, um, which is due to the pandemic, my five year old hasn't been to nursery. Mm. And, and we know quite rightly some parents have made difficult choices um, mm. to, to work from home and, yeah. and they've needed yeah. to as well, either for financial reasons or indeed for health and safety reasons. Yeah. Um, and we respect all of those decisions. But mm -hmm. this parent says, I'm worried that he doesn't know how to socialize. He hardly has any contact with any other children. Yeah. What can I do to now get him ready for school? And, and you, you started a touch on that, actually. Yeah. You were talking about socialization. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering how we can help this parent in answering their question. I mean, you know, I know the school year is wrapping up, but even if it was, you know, approaching the school now to say, how could we maybe have some sessions with, you know, social play to get them prepared to come to school within the school setting? Um, also making a plan with the school. Mm -hmm. How are we going to into what, you know, skills are needed in order to be successful for September start? And the plan for welcoming the child in on that day and what his week might look like or the first month might look like if we're concerned that the social anxiety might be there. Um, also, it's a good chance over the summer to meet up with some social play groups. They are available and, you know, they do do sessions these days. And I think it's highly critical just, you know, for some positive interaction. And we wanted to all be positive so that we learn that, you know, being away from home for a bit in a social group setting is positive and I have the skills to collaborate with my peers and get along. Yeah. I mean, Emma, your area of expertise is is early years and you must see this all the time, I'm sure. So, yeah. Important, but also for the parent to build that positive reinforcement in, in terms of um, what we would call a social story, but maybe stories about yes. Um, going back to you know, or going okay. to school or going yeah. back to school and and talking through all the excitement and, and getting ready for that and what you know oh that's your lunchbox and this is you know okay. and really preparing them in terms of the physical preparation as well as the um, opportunity to socialize uh, outside of school um, and that positive language and linked to that clearly is then the separation from the parent at the same time as being able to socialize with other students and really building that process up prior to them coming back to school so they're also able to one come in but to leave um, the parent as well so putting you know setting up those opportunities prior to that where maybe they are with another adult without yeah. mum being there or a family member being there so they're getting used to then also being away with somebody else because mm -hmm. that is part of the process which we've also found has, has been um, a quite quite a challenge for some of our students who have been out of school for a while one in terms of interacting with the peer, their peers but two then also leaving their their parent um, yeah, parents, I mean, yeah. One the of the things time. we were talking about earlier, actually, was you know sometimes it's the, it's the adult anxiety mm. that it's manifest manifests yeah. itself onto the child, you know, mm. and mm. and you talked earlier about you know the key 
importance of communication, mm -hmm. building those relationships, Sarah, that you were just talking about with yes. the school prior to starting. Mm -hmm. um, how do we how do we support parents and say to them, look, please don't worry. It will yeah. be okay. We've been yeah. doing this for a long time. Please, you know, yeah. don't worry. Sorry if I start with I you. Think, I think it's important for parents, especially if it's going to be the first year entering the school or the first year back physically to school, to know that it is normal. We do see those crying children. Yeah. We And it might seem horrible. And believe me, the minute that you leave, well, within half an hour or so, the child has settled down. But I think it's mentally getting yourself ready for that as a parent. It's very difficult to do, but you need to be prepared and know that, you know, prolonging that separation can actually make it worse. And over talking the situation can also make it worse because you have to phrase it positively, not, you know, the fear of mommy is going to leave and don't worry, it's going to be okay, I'm going to come back later. That can sound more alarming to the child. So I think it's learning how to have those conversations about the first day. Yeah. and being prepared that it may not go as a perfect magical morning and it's okay if it's your child that's crying yeah yeah, yeah. And, and being brave i think that's a really hard <laughs> message for parents to be brave themselves to do all the things that have just been said but you just have to trust us as uh, practitioners that we have seen this before uh, many times it, this is what you know is is expected this is normal uh, and to trust us that when they when they come into our care we will ensure that they are safe and well looked after and if of course there is um, any mm. concerns we would call the parent but we're also there for them as well yeah. so if they leave you know uh, leave them with us then yeah. we are there to support the parent after that as well but be brave so, so I think the message to the mum or the dad, whoever it is that has sent that in is, you know, please don't worry. We, we understand that people have had to make tough choices, but our schools, regardless of curriculum or where they are, are very prepared for this. Yeah. Uh, and we know what we're doing, really. Look, it's been so good to talk to both you, Zara, and to you, Emma, today. Um, challenging topics, challenging discussions. Um, about yes anxiety in our young people but I hope that um, you know that the overriding message that we left you with today which actually is a theme that's run across every mm -hmm. discussion group is building that strong relationship with the school yes. um, but making sure it's an open door discussion making sure you get to know the school as well as you can final thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with today Sarah if I start with you I just think reassuring parents that if your child does have an anxiety disorder be open with the school they're not going to prejudge actually it helps us because then we can reach out we can work with you we can work with the therapist learn what skills are being taught to the child to help them manage their anxiety and we'll implement it and reinforce it in our school as well that it's not going to be a taboo or a stigma and we're not going to label or prejudge. We're open to it and it's totally normal. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm exactly that. We all have different emotions and feelings at different mm -hmm. times and it's okay to be worried and it's actually what, what, how we manage that. But again, it goes back to the yeah. being open and honest and having that um, you know, parent-school relationship whereby we can ensure that the child gets the best care that they need. I think I think you summed it up earlier, Sarah, when you said, you know, it's okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're all having those moments together, but certainly on behalf of the Schools and Nursery Show this afternoon, um, it's been a privilege to talk to you ladies. Um, thank you thank so you. much for your insights, for thank your you. advice, um, and for your comments, and I hope they've been of some help to you uh, this afternoon from the Schools and Nursery Show. Thank you very much. <laughs>